the first thing I thought of when I saw this is like, oh, this could be great for cats. Cats can't go on walks. Cats get fat. They need exercise. <laughs> you know, like chonky cats are a real thing. Go on Reddit, like subreddit, like Speak chonky cats. Speak for your cats, own like, cat, Ariel. <laughs> I, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, John. Do you have a cat? No. <laughs> I was like, is that a sensitive okay. topic? I know. I was like, did a I just touch cat? a nerve? I'm sorry. If John's a cat person, it does not strike me that way. Well, I'm speaking for all the cat people out there. <laughs> Justice for Chunk. I'm just saying. I love a good fat cat. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Another Bite, where we rewatch some of the most innovative and intriguing pitches from Shark Tank. I'm Jory, and I'm joined by Ariel. Hi, everyone. And John. What's up, everybody? Love it. (laughs) (laughs) Amazing. (laughs) So today we're looking at some of the greatest pitches ever gold. I mean, told. That's right, folks. It's the Golden (laughs) Ticket episode. What exactly is the Golden Ticket? You may remember us mentioning it once on our segment on Frywall. The Golden Ticket is a real piece of gold that Lori hands out to her favorite pitch of a Shark Tank season, one that she only gives to entrepreneurs where she's willing to give them exactly what they're asking for. It doesn't appear every season, but when it does, it signifies that Lori is all in on a product or a company. So without further ado, here's some pitches that really caught her attention. But before all of that, a quick word from the folks that keep the lights on. You know it, we know it. Next year is creeping up quick. If you want to win inside your niche in 2024, you need tech that puts you in the pilot seat. The new HubSpot Sales Hub will help you close out the year strong and kickstart your success in 2024. Teams can collaborate on every inch of the customer journey and keep operations running smoothly with comprehensive prospecting workspace and powerful sales analytics tools that keep data connected across teams. And with over 1,400 integrations, there's a ton of ways to mix in new features. So finish out Q4 strong and gear up for the new year with HubSpot Sales Hub. Learn more at HubSpot.com forward slash sales. So first in the tank, we have Super Cubes, and it is brought to us by Jake and Michelle Sindowski. They come asking for a $400,000 investment for a 5% stake in their company, which means that they're valuing their company at $8 million. The problem that they're trying to solve is, you know, you make a big batch of grandma's chili and you're definitely not going to eat it in one sitting. So you freeze it, but freezing it in a bag is messy. Glassware breaks. So what do you do? Well, in this case, you buy Supercube, which is, according to our founders, the best way to freeze and store your liquids in perfect proportions. And essentially what it looks like is just like these big silicone ice trays where the pocket kind of varies in sizes depending on which one you buy. And it comes with this steel rim so the tray doesn't collapse when you stack it and it has a lid for safe storage and food safety. So thinking about Super Cubes and our initial take on the product, what are our initial thoughts? Love the name. And I feel like it's rare that I'm a big fan of the branding already when entrepreneurs come out, but it's such a fun little play on words like super cubes, super yeah. cubes. I feel like all the sharks were like, yeah, getting into it. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think it's a really well thought out product. I think it was really evident that the founders, you know, took the time to see what some of the common pain points are with current container solutions and then improve on that. I was really expecting it just to be this like flimsy silicone ice cube of like soup. But instead, like having that steel packaging, I think, was just what sold me in. Well, using grandma's chili as the uh, the flagship product was a bit evocative. Could have been something more tenable, like a chicken noodle soup or something. But hey, listen, OK, every time I listen to a pitch, like there's a scale of how big I think it's going to be. And it's like mm-hmm. rides a little like chart. And in the beginning, I mean, like, oh, this isn't going to be big and this is going to be big. And then, oh, maybe it's not going to be big when I learn their sales. And, you know, this one, the peak of when I knew this was going to be a big product was when Kendra Scott, who is one of the guest mm-hmm. sharks on this particular episode, said the line, as a mom, I love this product. Now, we've talked about moms before and the role that moms play in household purchases. As of like 2018, the buying power of moms for household items was like $2.4 trillion in the U.S., and they make 85% of all household purchases. So Sizable market. And it just, as Kendra Scott said that, it became so clear to me what the flywheel for this business is. And it goes a little something like (laughs) this. Mom, who wants to be more thrifty, more organized, and better manage meals, which is literally every mom, Mm -hmm. sees super cubes on the internet from another mom 
buys super cubes and is delighted by them and then shares on the internet because it makes her look awesome. And then that flywheel repeats forever. And so I just think that, you know, not only is this a good product because it has real functional use cases, but I think that this has a real flywheel associated with it that's going to get word of mouth going and is going to drive a lot of sales and a lot of efficiency in their sales and marketing expenses. That's such a good point, John. I feel like a lot of that mom segment really is active and based off of community and like family groups. So seeing like the mom's groups on Facebook and everyone's very like active and sharing like what their tips are and their recipes. And by the way, as a dad, I love super cubes too. Like <laughs> I actually, I do a large amount of the cooking in my household and oh. I'm always looking for better storage options. And you know what? They're right. Putting chili in a bag. I've put chili in a bag. I can't recommend it. It is not a pretty process, mm -hmm. everybody. So I don't think this is only a mom product. I think this mm -hmm. could be any household product, but I do think that mom segment is such a powerful buying segment. And when Kendra Scott said that line, it was like a light bulb moment to yeah. me of exactly why I think Lori chose to give the golden ticket to this entrepreneur team, because this is just such an amazing, amazing product with great product market fit in an incredible segment of buyers. But another thing that I was thinking about, too, is just like even with like coffee, right? Like give me a whole coffee chunk. Yeah. <laughs> I think that just like the smoothie potential, too. Like I could also see this like branching into beverages. Slushies, mm -hmm. BG, BG pours, pours, making your own like froze can totally <laughs> see it. <laughs> but what was interesting about really this pitch is there didn't seem to be anything that was like obviously wrong with it, right? Like sometimes we get pitches that they're already kind of facing an issue with distribution or pricing or word of mouth. And in this case, this business was already really strong. It already had like a really good distribution on Amazon. There didn't seem anything initially wrong with the price point. The marketing kind of flywheel, if you will, is still going. They came to the tank looking for mentorship, which was like really, really interesting to see. Because in some ways, by the time we got to the Sharks offers, the founders found themselves in a situation where they could actually say no to some of the initial offers they got. Yeah. We have talked now about what a great flywheel it is, what a great product it is. It's also just an incredible business mm -hmm. right now, right? They've been growing very fast. They're on track to do 3 million in sales. They have 80% gross margins and they have a bunch of distribution opportunities that are very clear. They only do 10% of their business through their website. So only 10% of their business comes direct to consumer and only 10% comes wholesale. And so this is like the dream shark business. Like Dream Shark businesses are items that don't cost too much to buy inventory for that essentially just spit off a lot of cash and where a shark, if they get involved, can actually materially improve the performance of the business. And when you look at their distribution mix, you're like, oh, yeah, like a shark that has a team that, you know, focuses on direct to consumer acquisition, you know, could definitely spike sales there. And so I think this is why Lori just realized this is the perfect package. I'm not going to negotiate. I'm going to, you know, pull the Trump card out and just drop this golden ticket right on the table. What did you guys think about Kevin's initial offer of saying, hey, this is contingent on getting 70% of your sales direct to consumer? He came in with off asking for a royalty specifically, which I just felt was so greedy at that point, given that it was such a successful business. I thought it was interesting because I feel like sometimes Kevin comes in to intimidate, right? And it was interesting here because I, I thought that he came in with a royalty because that's very characteristic of Kevin. But what I thought was really interesting is actually how I feel like I knew this was a good business is he put two choices on the table, right? Like he came in with an offer mm -hmm. of 400000 for 3% and then this royalty ask, but then also 400000 for 15%, right? And the fact that he was almost willing to negotiate his offer with himself and be like, you choose what's more valuable to you, but I have two choices that you can essentially choose from, showed me that like Kevin was like aware that this was a really good business. This was the perfect kind of shark deal. Yeah, I mean, you know, you can go and run all the math on whether it is better to only give up 3% of your business and do a royalty for a million dollars worth of sales or whatever, which, by the way, basically comes down to how big of a business you think it's going to be. If you think it is going to be a massive business and you are not obsessed about getting as much of a return as the entrepreneur right away, then you want to keep as much of your equity as possible. And so maybe doing a royalty is not a bad deal. 
you know, a 40 cent royalty on a $20 sale is it's only 2% and they've got 80% gross margins. It's not really going to impact their ability to grow the business that much. And so if they're like, we think we are going to sell a hundred to $200 million of these every year. And we want as much of that as we can take, then maybe the first Kevin deal is good. And I think it's kind of what he was trying to do. He was trying to say, listen, you could do a deal that bets on long-term value and you get to own much more of that long-term value, but it'll cost you. Or you can give up more now for, you know, a different model there. So I think, you know, it just comes down to what their belief is, their confidence is, and what sort of return they're looking for as the entrepreneurs. Definitely. And it was also interesting enough that Barbara kind of threw herself into the ring. But we know that when Lori comes in with the big guns, the golden guns, when she comes in with the golden ticket, it also kind of seemed like these founders were really keyed in on Lori as their dream shark. So I feel like as soon as the golden ticket was on the table and she was willing to give them that exact ask of 400000 for 5%, there was no other negotiations. The deal was made. And you could just tell that Barbara was just like so taken by it because she like visibly slumped in her chair, which just also tells me that she knew that this was going to be big. Which is the first for Barbara. I was surprised to see her get mm-hmm. so sharky coming in at the 20%. Like I, she's not one that I would pick to be the most greedy or going after like more equity. But usually that's a Kevin for me in my mind. But to see Barbara do that, it's like, oh, you know, she really, really wanted that. Yeah. Well, I mean, listen, if Barbara really, really wanted it, she should have offered $400,000 for 5%, which is what they asked for. That's actually what, Lori, it's not like Barbara offered a better Mm -hmm. deal to the entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Like, Lori actually offered the best deal between Kevin, Barbara, and Lori. We'll talk about this later. There was a pitch, though, where Barbara actually offered more money Mm -hmm. and Lori beat her somehow on a worse Mm -hmm. deal with the golden (laughs) ticket. And that's the one where you're like, oh, like, what is going on here? (laughs) Where are we? (laughs) And this is the power of the golden ticket. It's like the golden Mm -hmm. ticket comes out and like blinders come on the entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. and they're just like, it's the golden ticket. This is what I asked for. This is the like, it's kind of like doesn't matter if there's a better deal on the table. And uh, I think. Lori is savvy about using it. And you can see it with the other sharks. They all shake their heads when it comes out. They're like, oh, come on. But when you think about it from a psychological perspective, like what does that do to the negotiation table, right? Like it adds more pressure to the person who's, you know, making the decision of who they're going to partner with. It adds on to the, okay, don't listen to anyone else and just focus on me and my offer instead of like distracting them to potentially get more, like lose their business. So I think it's a really interesting psychological play too. Um, when you're standing kind of in the founder's shoes. Yeah, it's a scarcity marketing tactic on a deal, which is incredible. It's so well done by Lori. Mm -hmm. And she's giving away nothing in getting this extra like bump in her ability to get a deal done. It's amazing. You know, in theory, you're like a golden ticket holder. So like maybe people will buy more of your product. Like probably (laughs) not. Like, you know, so it's all just, it's a super clever, super Mm -hmm. clever marketing tactic by her to win deals. If the other sharks adopted this kind of marketing play, what do you think their golden ticket would be? Like their equivalent? Okay, well, I don't know if you have to stick to like movie themes for this because like, you know, the golden ticket is from a movie. It's Willy Wonka. But for movie themes, I had thought a little bit. So Mark, I was trying to think about a movie about basketball. You know, Mark owns the Dallas Mavericks. I thought, though, you could go a little more more creative and you could uh, take a page out of the movie Kazam. (gasps) Where Shaq <laughs> is a genie who comes out of a boombox and Mark could give away a golden boombox. Uh, yeah. A little twist. Like smart humor. Mr. Wonderful <laughs> either has to give away a golden crown because he only wants royalties. Royalties. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes. <laughs> or a golden statue of himself because he's just so into himself. The golden wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The golden oh wonderful. Gosh. The golden, the golden oh. wonderful. Definitely. Love it. I feel like Rob would be like, a golden bow tie. I don't know. I think he's just like so buttoned up all the time. It would just be like his like, yes. his like little style. Well, you know, Robert is super into cars. Oh, good point. Okay. And so I was thinking, you know, he could have like a golden like leather jacket like Vin Diesel in Fast and Furious or something like that, you know? Part of this is like, okay, if you want to one-up Lori on a golden ticket, get a golden jacket made that's like, you know, you could wear it. Or maybe that should be what Draymond does. Uh, you know. I was going to say golden sneakers. Mm-hmm. Um, golden sneakers. Just have a full outfit. They should have a whole like segment of just a golden day where every shark gets to have their own golden prop. Which of those options would you want like personally to own? 
I want the original golden ticket. I don't know. Mm, like, I think once when you add more, yeah, when you add more products to the mix, it loses its novelty. Fair enough. I want the boom box. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the fun one. Because I want to stand with it over my head. I want to stand with it over my head. Like a cliche 1980s, <laughs> yes. 1990s movie? Stop. Pick a deal with me. <laughs> I love that. Oh. <laughs> So just to wrap up this segment, though, there was an interesting kind of company update coming to us from Supercubes. So 24 hours after airing, they made $938,000 in sales. Mm. So their sales were super. And it would have been more, but they actually sold out of all of their products. So like the Mm. reason that didn't continue to scale is just like they sold them all. Since airing, they've done a total of $8.6 million in sales. Lifetime sales are up at $14 million. So if you're trying to freeze your chili for ice cubes, John, you can do that. I just will never have the punch. <laughs> So next in the tank, we have bug bite thing. And this comes to us from uh, mom and daughter Kelly Higney and Ellen McAllister. So the duo comes to us asking for $150,000 for a 10% stake in their company, which shakes out to about $1.5 million. And the problem they're really trying to solve is, you know, like home remedies, like dryer sheets. They're not really super efficient at addressing why mosquito bites itch. It's the mosquito saliva, which actually I didn't know. So that was this whole learning moment. And for the venom that things like bees like leave under your skin. So introducing bug bite thing. It's a product that alleviates the sting and the swelling from bug bites or stings. And it's essentially, you might have to help me out with this, but to visualize it, it's sort of like this plastic syringe or I guess like a suction cup that you put on your skin and it has a little lever that you pull up on and it creates this like airtight seal that essentially like just sucks the goop out of your skin and out of the bite. Yeah, it looks like a toy syringe. If you yes. have if you've ever seen a kid's syringe, like a toy one, you know, from a doctor kit, mm-hmm. it looks a lot like that, except instead of a point on the bottom, it's an open hole on the bottom where you can just like stick it over your skin and make a suction. Which just sounds gross. Super gross. But they were able to like market it in a way that didn't sound gross. Like just clean off the cap. No big deal. But here's all the benefits. Like I love the demonstration. Yeah, we <laughs> suck venom out of your skin and then you just like unscrew this cap and like. Yeah. You know. They made it a very pleasant user experience. <laughs> yeah. It's a bug bite thing. We talked about vitamins versus painkillers on a recent episode. You know, vitamins are nice to have. They conceptually make you healthier. Mm -hmm. uh, But who knows how much? And it's like kind of like, you know, when money gets tight, they kind of get cut. And then there's painkillers, which are a must have. They make acute pain disappear. And, you know, you always buy another bottle of Advil when you run out. This is literally a painkiller. So right off the bat, I'm Mm -hmm. pumped. This is great. Okay, this is a painkiller. This is, I think, a brilliant solution Mm -hmm. to a universal problem. This has brilliant unit economics, 80% margin, and it has a brilliant name. I think Bug Bite Thing is one of the greatest product namings that I have ever heard in my entire life. Really? I love it. I wasn't sold on it. I don't know. No. What else do you call it? Venom sucker? Suction thingy. I don't know. (laughs) I guess thing is still in the name. You're right. Oh my gosh. (laughs) It works. It makes it seem super attainable. Hmm. It's like fun to play with. Get me that bug bite Mm -hmm. thing. People are like, what's the bug bite thing? It's, I don't know. It's literally called bug bite thing. And people are like, oh, it's memorable. Like people see it in stores and be like, oh yeah, I heard about bug bite thing. I should try it. In the Boy Scouts, you you learn about how to treat snake bites if mm-hmm. they occur. And there was always this question about, like, if you get bit by a poisonous snake, should you suck the blood out? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I know that sounds weird, but I was very attracted to this product because of that notion of right. being able to actually extract the venom. It felt very, very pure to me for some reason. So this reason. is a product you would buy. I, in fact, I want to go buy a bug bite thing. This sounds great. I think the biggest thing for me that I was wondering is like, okay, does this actually work? The before and after photos, I think, were really helpful to see because anyone who has kids and mosquito bites know how difficult it is to get them to not itch (laughs) their mosquito bites. The proof is going to matter a ton, Ariel, right? Because Mm -hmm. like the Amazon reviews and the word of mouth and people just sharing that it works is going to matter a lot because I had the same thought. If there were two things that bugged me about the product, (laughs) number one was, yeah, there is some doubt in there about whether or not it actually would work. Like once you get bit, within what time do you have to apply it, right? Or remove the venom, like all that stuff. I do think, Ariel, one of the ways that they are combating this, like, does it work, is their price point. 
they're only selling it for $10, which yeah. the lower the price, the more people are willing to take a bet on a product that has questionable efficacy <laughs> because it's only 10 bucks. Yeah, low barrier of entry. What's if they were bucks? charging like 30 bucks, 40 bucks, you're like, ooh, wow, you'd really have to prove it. Yeah, no, that's a fair point. And I think they said, what, their last year sales were about half a million and in five months they were selling, what, 800,000 at some point with that 80% margin. Like that's... <laughs> really solid business performance for them. They probably could go up realistically to like a 15 or $20 price point. They might be able to. They definitely could go up in their valuation. You know, mm -hmm. they came in asking to be valued at $1.5 million, but with 80% gross margins and the kind of revenue growth that they're seeing right now, I don't know. I think they could have easily gotten a $4 million valuation, you know, $5 million valuation based on their margins and their revenue growth. So, you know, it made it a lot easier for the sharks to give them exactly what they asked for. And Kevin right out the gate was like, you know, so nice that someone came in with a fair valuation. And I was immediately yeah. like, oh no, they should have asked for more. Yeah. The minute he says it's fair, it's nope, you're being undersold. Means it's super cheap. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's unpack what this product is, right? These founders don't own this product, right? They don't even have exclusive rights internationally to this product. So essentially what they went and did is they found a manufacturer in Denmark and were like, we're going to be your exclusive U.S. partner, and we're going to import these products and sell them at a higher price point, which I think, to me at least, raises issues with like scaling the company, right? Especially internationally, if this is also like a device that the market internationally knows about. So I was kind of curious about your take on this actually being a product that's brought in through a partner rather than something that inventors themselves brought to Shark Tank. I think this is one of the first few segments that I've seen where this has been the case, and it's not a founder either inventing something or licensing something. thought it was interesting to hear how they came about it, right? Because the mom was talking to someone who was either, you know, customer or someone that she was working with saying, oh, you haven't heard about this? You haven't heard about the bug bite thing? So again, that power of word of mouth, it just kind of keeps coming back. But I think, you know, it was a very interesting move. I don't know, John, if you have any perspective of that kind of approach of just saying, hey, I'm going to take this for a specific market and run with it versus going all in. Well, I think it depends how big the market is and how airtight your exclusivity is and mm -hmm. how much you have to pay to get that exclusivity. I think those are probably the factors that you would figure out to evaluate if it is a defensible business for them or not. I think we're kind of asking like, oh, is this defensible or not? Mm -hmm. And, you know, if there's patents on it, and this is probably the kind of the only version of a product like this, which is probably the case, and uh, they have really good exclusivity on it in a huge market like the U.S., it doesn't worry me that much, especially given how much it's growing, what the cash looks like, and what the profitability is. But if that was only like a one-year exclusivity or something like that, then I might get worried. And, you know, all of a sudden you end up in a world where customers have a lot of choice. And when customers have a lot of choice, you know, the price gets driven down. And so then your margins deteriorate and that's kind of what happens. That's fair. And I don't think it actually worried the sharks too much for all my concerns about it, because I feel like we got a bit of like a feeding frenzy between Rohan, Barbara, Kevin and Lori. It seemed like they started to kind of like pick at each other of like Rohan's like, well, you want to be in like pharmaceutical chains? I'm in every single one. You want products here and there? I can get you there. So it was a bit interesting. I don't think they it even phased them that this was like more of a partnership deal rather than like a product specifically. Yeah, the editing in this segment, specifically towards the end of just the suspenseful zoom in of like the founder's face and like every like going paneling over the sharks and the suspenseful music, waiting for Lori's response. Like it just all really built up really well to good production. I was on the edge <laughs> of my seat, honestly, as I was watching this segment. I was like, I feel I feel anxious yeah. <laughs> and I don't know why. <laughs> But, you know, but. Lori swooped in and was like, yet mm -hmm. again, I have this Trump card. And lo and behold, whipped out her golden ticket and gave the founders exactly what they were looking for. Yeah, yeah it was a surprise and delight moment. <laughs> for sure. It was a surprise and delight versus yeah. want a date where it just like drove me wild and then down a, like, Please stop. a, a hate cycle. <laughs> yeah, but I think this was actually the pitch that you were talking about, John, where we saw the case that actually like Barbara offered more money for the same equity, I guess. And Rohan offers the exact same numbers as Lori. Do you think in this case it was like the golden ticket on the table or do you think it was more of a case of like Lori was the favorite shark with all her connections with like QVC? My feeling on this particular situation where uh, 
you know, Lori offered a worse deal than Barbara, but still what the entrepreneurs asked for. Mm -hmm. Barbara was actually willing to give them more than they asked for to try and sweeten the pot. She thought the product was so good. And, you know, Lori ended up giving them what they asked for, but they had a better deal that they left on the table. And I think it was mostly because they wanted Lori. I think she was their dream shark. That's kind of the vibe I got. And when the golden ticket came out, it was uh, game over. One does not say no to the golden ticket. <laughs> How do you say no to no. the golden ticket? <laughs> well, the good news is the golden ticket definitely paid off. So since appearing on Shark Tank, the bug bite thing has taken over major retailers. So you can find this in Target, CVS, mm. Amazon, Lowe's. This thing is very accessible. So if you struggle with bug bites, go forth. But the last revenue update we got was actually in 2021. They were expected to hit $15 million by the end of the year. So not too shabby. Wow. Couldn't get our hands on 2022 earnings, but that's our recent update and it's a good one. So we can expect the bug bite thing to kind of remain around. Really, everyone can use this product. So not surprised that they saw that much success. As a side note, how much do we think that this like solid gold ticket is worth in dollars? Like if they were to sell it? I don't know why. I thought it was like plastic coated in gold. And when they said that, I was like, oh, OK. Well, how much gold is it? Like what's a wedding ring cost? A couple hundred bucks? <laughs> I guess without the diamonds, sure. Probably like 2000 I think she could sell it for a couple hundred bucks. <laughs> Do you think Shark Tank fans are rabid enough, though, to like cause a bidding war in their own, a feeding frenzy, mm. if you will? Oh, I bet so. I bet there's some people. If you're listening, if you're a Shark Tank fan, how much would you be willing to pay for the golden ticket? In a way, it's sort of like a couple of extra hundred dollars for free. <laughs> yeah. It'd be, it'd make a great keychain. It's just the right mm. size. I'd wear it as a necklace oh. so everyone would know. <laughs> I am the golden You ticket. could frame it like people used to do with their first dollar. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Love that. If you've gotten a gold ticket, you should definitely let us know how you've used it, how you've spent it, what's gone on after the golden ticket behind the scenes. Did you lose it? Did your dog eat it? <laughs> Speaking of dogs, do you see what I did there? So last in the tank, we have Swift Paws. And Swift Paws comes to us from founder Megan Wolfgram. She comes asking for $240,000 for a 6% stake in her company, which means she's asking for a valuation of $4 million. And the problem that she's trying to solve is going to sound very familiar if you own a dog. And it's that it's hard sometimes to give dogs all the time and attention and essentially a enrichment that they need to be happy and healthy mentally. So she introduces us to this product, Swift Paws, which is the pet enrichment toy that lets you create the best game of chase ever in your backyard. And to kind of visually describe this, it's best if you've seen or kind of know what like lure coursing is. I am definitely one of those people that have watched competitive dog challenges yeah. and competitions. Yeah. What? So, yep, no I have. Way. I didn't know it was the it's whole thing. It's the whole thing. And let me tell you, uh, they used to always have them on Animal Planet. And I've actually like gone to them before. So anyway, essentially what it is, it's like you can visualize it as if there's a moving plastic bag, if you will, on a string. And if it's a straight shot, the dog is just like running in a straight line. This product puts sort of four strings together into a diamond shape. And essentially the little bag toy kind of pivots between them really quickly and you can control it with a remote control. Imagine like a small baseball mm -hmm. diamond where there is string from base to base to base and that string moves on a pulley system really, really fast and you like clip on something that a dog can chase. So the dog just runs in circles around and around and around and around and around. It's really great for dogs with high prey drives. Good. Yeah. When you said, Jory, you were like, I was trying to think how to visually describe this. And I thought the best way to do it was lore coursing. I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> no, so that's what it is. <laughs> but I then Ariel the was like, oh, yeah, of course. And I was like, <laughs> oh, my gosh, maybe I'm the only one oh, who doesn't no, know no, about no. this thing. No, John. So the only reason I knew is because I went down a wormhole mm. because, like, I had to stop watching this segment because I'm like, what is lore coursing? And I'm like, how whole big thing. is this industry? It's a $3.8 billion industry in 2021 wow. for pet training services growing at a CAGR of 6% from 2020. 22 to 2031, uh, according to Allied Market Research. Dog agility is yeah, big. I was like, wow, this is a huge, I had no clue. There's like lore training. They have also the plastic pole things. Mm -hmm. Dog jumping is included in it. I nerded out over this. 
But what's interesting as we kind of like bring in this talk of, you know, there's a professional use case for this. That's sort of how this product got started, right? Like the founder got into uh, dog agility competitions after finishing college. And that was essentially how this product came to be is it was a professional grade piece of equipment that she was selling to these competitions or even to zoos, which I thought was interesting, like visualizing a lion Mm -hmm. chasing one of these. That's when she got the patent for the technology. But what was interesting here is that's what sparked the idea to get to the product that she's actually pitching on Shark Tank, which is like a product for the average dog owner to set up in their backyard. And I was curious, like what you thought of like this move of going from like a professional piece of equipment down to more of like a consumer grade piece of equipment and being able to kind of not only slash your price, but then also reach a greater audience. I don't think the concept is necessarily new. I think the issue here, though, and they kind of get into that is around the pricing and kind of that big gap between pro grade materials and equipment versus like what's actually more affordable for the everyday consumer. Yeah. Anytime you add more products into your product portfolio, it adds complexity and cost to your business, just like straight up. And so if you are an entrepreneur who's trying to build a business, Like it is a much better idea to stick with one product and grow it as much as possible as opposed to adding many more products. That's a generalized rule. Like there's all sorts of cases where multi-product makes sense. And if you were thinking about like adding a pro tier and a consumer tier, the things you would have to believe in order to think that was a good idea would first of all be that you have some sort of cost advantage you know, by manufacturing that because you have the pro manufacturing process, you can make the consumer grade cheaper, which should mean you can lower your price more. To Ariel's Mm -hmm. point, that is not the case here. The price is very expensive still for the consumer grade. The second thing you'd need to believe is that your association with that pro brand will increase your sales on the consumer side. So if her market is just people who go to like lower coursing professionally and want to buy one for their backyard, then it's a very smart move to make a consumer grade option. If her idea is I want every backyard owner in the world to own one of these, and most of them will know nothing about lower coursing and my association with professional lower coursing, then I don't think she gets any advantage from being the owner of the professional brand. Mm. You know, if you think about fitness, you know, TRX does well with home sales because people see it in the gym. They've got that association, right? Where with the weight racks that we saw, you're like, oh, people aren't seeing those in the professional gym. So like, you know, you've got to be able to make that association in order for the credibility to come from the pro tier, I think. But I'm wondering too, like if the product was open to a more like wider, like generalized market, kind of what are the pros and cons there? Because the first thing I thought of when I saw this is like, oh, this could be great for cats. Cats can't go on walks. Cats get fat. They need exercise. <laughs> you know, like chonky cats are a real thing. Go on Reddit, like subreddit, like Speak chonky for your cats. own like, cat, Ariel. <laughs> I- <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, John, do you have a cat? No. <laughs> I was like, is that a sensitive oh, okay. topic? I know. I was like, did a I have such cat? a nerve? I'm sorry. If John's a cat person, it does not strike me that way. Well, I'm speaking for all the cat people out there. <laughs> Justice for Chunk. <laughs> I'm just saying. I love a good fat cat. But like, you want them to get exercise and lose weight. Like, I could see a cat being all about this if you add like a little toy. But I'd be curious to see, could you market it a different way? Because instead of going after those lower coursing, like professionals in training, is there an opportunity there to maybe brand it slightly differently, make it feel like a different product, have it live within the ecosystem, but then reach a more broader audience? Yeah, you're totally right, Ariel. This is the way for her. And this is why the issues with her business become such a problem, right? Is like she is asking people to pay, oh, $450 to buy like a backyard dog toy. You're like, oh, I could buy a tennis ball for a buck. Fair. You know, and I could throw that and that's good for me too. But you market it as like you live in an apartment. You don't have a place to bring your dog out. Give it exercise, you know, gift well, from- it's, it's true. So this is what I'm saying though. It's like, this is why you've got to address if that's the market you want to go in, which is what I would do too, is I would market it much more mass market. I would bring the price down to a more mass market price. And then I would actually divest away from this whole pro business and just be like, this consumer business is way bigger. My association with the pro business doesn't matter at all to the buyers of a mass market backyard dog product. Get the price down to 100 bucks, call it a day. That's interesting. Why do you think the move from pro grade to consumer, like solely focusing on a consumer offering would be? Is it because there's a bigger market, there's more opportunity, as opposed to continuing with the pro grade? offering? Well, my starting assumption is that it is distracting 
and confusing to be running multiple product lines to multiple segments of buyers. If you have $100 to spend marketing your product, uh, do you want to spend it all on your consumer product or do you want to spend $50 on your pro product and $50 on your consumer product? And actually, like the manufacturing complexity is much higher. Maybe you need more people to run the whole process. And this is where it's like either you're getting major cost efficiencies because you run this pro business and therefore the consumer business is a no brainer, but she's not pricing the consumer product at a price point that makes me think she's getting those efficiencies. Yeah. If she could get down to the 199 price point, which goes into the sharks. Yeah. Like, or a hundred bucks, like could totally be doable. But they kind of touch on that with some of the manufacturing issues that she was running into and cost. Yeah. Because it seems like she was like assembling them in her hometown, right? Mm -hmm. And some of the manufacturing things that I think the sharks could really help with was like, you know, driving the cost down, potentially like working on the fact that some of the materials she's buying have like an order minimum of a thousand parts. Mm -hmm. So definitely needing some more cash flow for those orders. There are a lot of problems with this business. In fact, Mm -hmm. I cannot believe Lori gave her the golden ticket. Like this business on paper was so bad that Kevin, who literally makes an (laughs) offer on every single business, was like, I'm not getting involved with this. I'm out. Like right away. It was just like, no way am I dealing with this totally unattractive business. Mm -hmm. Like every other golden ticket we've seen has huge margins, Mm -hmm. a low price point, wild growth and major consumer applicability. Mm -hmm. Made me wonder if Lori's just a dog person and maybe Mm -hmm. dogs just win deals. Like, I'm not sure. It's possible she's just a dog person. But her gross margins are actually pretty good. They're 70%, but her net margins are only 10%. She's got no money. She's not spitting any cash out from this business because it costs so much to manufacture and sell this product. So I think she's going to have to really address some of those issues and, um, and focus more. I think this was a golden ticket giveaway because Lori Mm -hmm. was more invested in the entrepreneur. I think the entrepreneur really showed just like a lot of characteristics of being a strong leader, of like keeping her employees on the team when they were having like difficulties in their business cycle. And then she shared her story about Pretzel, the dog, which almost made me cry, kind of made me tear up a little bit, how his paw prints are on the bottom of every single unit and how passionate she was. So I actually think Lori gave this to her as an investment to Megan herself and like her future of being like a leader as opposed to the actual product. Like I would be surprised if this product is still around at four. 49. The good news is, is 24 hours after airing, they did $100,000 in sales. So for all the price point was really high. They definitely sold some units, so much so that they actually sold out of all of their existing inventory. As of the end of Q3 2022, they had hit a million dollars in revenue. No saying how much of that they actually profited from, but it's definitely still a business for sure. Hmm. All right. So we have had three segments that Lori has judged as gold, but we can only have one golden bite each. So thinking about each of our segments, who are you giving your golden bite, your golden ticket to between Super Cubes, Bug Bite Thing, and Swift Paws? I'm Super Cubes. I'm so pumped on Super Cubes. It's such a great business. It's got word of mouth social flywheel, Mm -hmm. and it's only one of the most attractive segments in household purchasing. I think they're going to have a great run. I'm going to go with bug bite thing just because I get really bad bug bites and I'm tired of using a hot spoon all the time. And if something can actually help me because I swell up a real spoon? bad. Yeah, it's the only thing that helps me. Hmm. That and like some crushed up Benadryl and like a little <laughs> ointment cream uh, usually helps, but I get really bad reactions to bug bites. So I am the target audience. <laughs> so I think for me... uh It would probably be super cubes just because I am really bad at portion sizing. And this is a product that I was like, immediately I could use it. I love it. I want to buy it. (laughs) So I think my golden bite would go to super cubes. All right. Well, that wraps up today's episode. Today's episode was written and produced by the brilliant mind of Matthew Brown. Additional support comes from Melanie Romero. Are you following the show yet? Barbara, are you following? I'm out. (laughs) You know, she really is my favorite. You can follow and subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. Maybe that's Apple Podcasts. Maybe that's Spotify. Maybe you're that one person in the world who still uses a Microsoft Zune. R.I.P. 
Wherever works for you works for me, baby. That's it for me, for real this time. We'll see you next week in the tank for another bite.